our first learning module in this round of the application, and our second overall, is called Designing and Delivering Your Virtual Skilled Trades Class. The video features Bob Kilmer of Enumclaw High School in Enumclaw, Washington. After 36 years of teaching construction, architecture, woodworking, and computer-aided design, Bob is set to retire, so we're especially grateful for his insights this year. Bob was a 2017 grand prize winner of the Harbor Freight Tools for Schools Prize for Teaching Excellence and has remained a valuable resource to our growing network of exceptional skilled trades educators. In this video, Bob takes us through some of the essential ingredients for designing and delivering effective online skilled trades lesson plans, whether we're in the midst of an emergency or not. No app is going to replace a good teacher, said Bob, but by learning to embrace distance learning and lessons where students have a choice over pace, place, and path, we are finding that student engagement and learning curves go off the charts. Everyone benefits. Just like in round one, there was also a brief reading on this same topic for you to review, reflect, and respond. If you'd like to go a little deeper into the concept of designing and delivering effective skilled trades classes virtually, you'll find additional material in our resource library. You can use the main menu to click ahead and draw upon this supplemental content to help you answer the relevant application questions. Or you can dig in and explore it later if you prefer. In the meantime, we invite you to sit back and check out what nuggets you might be able to borrow from what Bob Kilmer has to say. Your first priority in setting up a distance learning environment is establishing a system. In my work with Jeff Utech and the Reimagine Washington Ed team, we call it our core four. The key here is that it's a simple system with a common language and it consists of four areas. The first area being home base. Home base is your LMS, your learning management system. That can consist of some type of application like Google Classroom, Schoology, Canvas, Hapara. That's where kids go. That's the home base where kids go to get assignments. The second part deals with two different types of video, asynchronous video, and synchronous video. Asynchronous video, recorded lessons, uh, that's, can you, you can use applications like Screencastify, Loom, WeVideo, Camtasia. And what that is, is for remote instruction. Uh, it should be delivered asynchronously, in other words, recorded, and it shouldn't be any longer than five to six minutes. If you need to record a 15 minute lesson, you need to break that up into three five-minute chunks and use something like language like, hey, welcome back after your first five minutes. The th third type of video or the third piece in the core four is synchronous video. And that's things like Google Meet, Zoom, Microsoft Teams. And synchronous video is used to set up office hours where you're trying to build relationships and checking in with kids and answering questions. No live instruction we have found should happen during synchronous video time. That should just be for social and emotional well-being and checking in with kids and building relationships. And finally, the last part of the core four is your file sharing and storage system. And for us, that's Google Drive, but that could be Microsoft OneDrive. That's where files are stored but it's also you're using the tools in those systems or those cloud-based applications to create your assignments. And that can be in Google Sheets or Slides or Forms or whatever you're using to create your assignments. Finally, I would say that teachers need to be cognizant of the amount of work that they are assigning and the types of assignments they are giving to kids. In an ideal system, 
It should be easy to navigate by all and give students control over the time and pace at which they access the material. When planning and creating a lesson of any type, whether it be in my classroom or in the shop or from a distance, there are always four things that I like to keep in the back of my mind. Number one, what knowledge do kids already have and what knowledge do they need to gain? Two, what skills do they need to practice and develop? Three, what type of experience can I create that is interesting, that is engaging, that is authentic, and it will help them grow as a student and as a person? And finally, how will I assess the learning and give meaningful feedback? Once I know what my target standards and competencies are, and once I know what I want kids to learn, I find the different tools to support the lesson that I'm delivering, whether it's in person or in the cloud. The final thing I would say is once the lesson is completed and it's planned out, I ask myself the final question, is this something that I would like to do as a student? As teachers, what we try and do is create spaces where kids feel safe and comfortable and whether they feel like they have some ownership. In our classrooms and our shops, we set up systems and routines that are predictable and safe and allow kids to interact and collaborate with their peers. In a blended distance learning model, it will be important for us to find ways to do that very same thing, to help kids stay connected. Here are a few suggestions. Conduct student check-ins to find out how kids are feeling about an assignment or what type of support they need. That can be done through a Google form or a Microsoft phone form. Set up office hours with various times during the week where students can jump on a virtual meeting like Zoom or Google Meets or Microsoft Teams to check in, to see their peers, to ask clarifying questions about the work or an assignment. A third strategy might be to set up a collaborative project that allows students to work together in virtual teams to solve a fun problem or to meet some type of need, what we do in CTE all the time. That can be done with shared Google Slides or even things like virtual scavenger hunts. Creating class flip grids to show student hobbies or building a shared Padlet so kids can share some uh, interesting images or things like that um, are also some ideas. Just like in our classrooms, our brick and mortar classrooms, we should try and incorporate multiple ways for students to receive feedback on their learning progress. Entry and exit tickets, discussions, self-reflection prompts, checklists, polls, sketch responsive, collaborative documents, visual symbols like emojis and memes, one-on-one -on -one or small group check-ins, discussion posts, word clouds are all strategies that can be used in a blended learning environment. How you record them and report them will vary from school to school. But another thing to keep in mind is our parents. They are an important part of this blended learning process and are the people that are going to be supporting kids at home. So here are some ways that we can continue to help include them. Office hours. Think about providing office hours for both students and for their parents using Zoom or Meets or Microsoft Teams. Hold live virtual learning sessions for parents and guardians. Let them experience your learning management system or your home base so that they know what it's all about and they can help students navigate that and see what it's like. Now, obviously phone calls and emails uh, to give and gain feedback about students' learning needs. That's also something that we should keep in mind and not forget about. And finally, your grade book. Clearly communicate to parents and guardians how to access your grades and by all means, keeping those up to date are important pieces to making sure that parents are informed 
and kids stay engaged in the process. Number one, be thoughtful about the type of assignments that you ask kids to do. Remember, if it's boring on paper, it'll be boring in the cloud. Ask yourself, is this the type of assignment that I would like to do as a student? Number two, remember that this is this media first generation. They watch a lot of videos. So keep it short, less than five minutes. Three, students want to see their teacher. When you create short videos, make sure that you're in them. It's hard and it takes some practice, but you can supplement your videos with other video sources from YouTube and, and other resources, but make sure that you are in some of your videos. Kids want to see you. Number four, post your videos to YouTube so you can track the analytics to find out if kids are watching them or not. And then finally, five, don't use live video to teach. Use live video to check in with your kids, build social and emotional well-being, building relationships, to use it to answer questions. Don't use it for direct instruction. It shouldn't happen during a live session. It should be asynchronously so that kids can go back and watch it time and time again. That's how you clone yourself.